homosexuality and male concubines in the Roman Empire. When people think of love and sex in ancient Rome, it tends to be pretty scandalous. Orgies here, there, and everywhere. The truth, however, is rarely black and white. Were the Romans more sexually liberated than we are today? The answer is not straightforward, though. Ancient Rome might appear remarkably sexually liberated, but when we scratch the surface, we discover a disturbingly seedy underbelly. Hello, friends. Well, if you often fantasize about the past and really want to know about the history of ancient civilizations, then you're in the right place. Welcome to Unthinkable Past, a channel better known for dishing up the outlandish ancient traditions of all times. Today, we'll be speaking of homosexuality and the truth of male concubines during the ancient Roman Empire. <laughs> so better buckle up and let's binge history together. Under Roman law, concubinage was a bit tolerated as the relationship used to be durable and exclusive. The practice allowed a Roman man to enter into an informal but recognized relationship with a concubina, a female concubine who might be free. Most often, a woman whose lower social status was an obstacle to her marriage. A concubinus, on the other hand, was a young male slave chosen by his master as a sexual partner before getting married to a female. Romans did not mark same-sex relations as homosexual. If an adult male used a slave or a prostitute, characteristically a youth, as his passive partner. These relations, however, were expected to play a secondary role in marriage, within which institution an adult male demonstrated his masculine authority as head of the household. Homosexuality may have been commonplace, and it sounds incredibly enlightening that there wasn't even a Latin word to differentiate between same-sex and mixed relationships, yet we also know that passive partners often face prejudice. Roman homosexuality was actually centered on power dynamics. The Roman attitude towards homosexuality was not liberal. It was just a result of their obsession with masculinity through penetration. In fact, the silent, compliant, and subservient wife was always expected in the ancient Roman Empire to turn a blind eye to her husband's sexual infelicities, while the man could philander as much as he liked so long as the mistress was unmarried, or if with a boy, he was over a certain age. Brothels, prostitutes, and dancing girls were considered fair game, as were older males, with the one crucial proviso that it was you who did the penetrating. Being passive and being penetrated was considered women's work, and men who submitted were considered deficient in via and virtus. They were denounced and ridiculed as effeminate. So same-sex in ancient Rome was thought to be fine for a man, although with restrictions. Well, to tell you the truth, more than any other institution, slavery unquestionably had an impact on male homosexual relationships in ancient Rome. While the widespread Hellenization of Roman society in the 2nd and 1st centuries BC eased the traditional hostility towards homosexuality and homosexual relations, and even, in cultured circles, encouraged the acceptance of male pederastic relations, this transformation of attitudes would have had less of an impact if Rome had not also simultaneously become a slave-owning society on a large scale due to its overseas conquests. Back in those days, Roman men often used to keep a male concubine or a bedmate before getting officially married. This type of concubinage has been described as a stable sexual relationship, not exclusive, but privileged, by Eva Cantarella, a renowned Italian classicist. And as far as the perks and emotions related to these kind of relationships are concerned, according to her research, the concubinus within the hierarchy of household slaves seems to have been regarded as holding a special or elevated status that was threatened by the introduction of a wife. For instance, in a wedding hymn, Catullus portrays the groom's concubinus as anxious about his future and fearful of abandonment. His long hair will be cut, and he will have to resort to the female slaves for sexual gratification, indicating that he is expected to transition from being a receptive sex object to one who performs penetrative sex. The concubinus might father children with women of the household, not excluding the wife, at least in invective. And surprisingly, the females and situation of the concubinus are treated as significant enough to occupy five stanzas of Catullus's wedding poem. He also plays an active role in the ceremonies, distributing the traditional nuts that the boy threw, rather like rice or birdseed in modern Western tradition. And to top all of that, it was not considered derogatory to be called a concubinus, as the title was often inscribed on tombstones as well. Crazy, isn't it? Coming to the nature of the relationship. Well, the relationship with a concubinus might be discreet or more open. That is, male concubines sometimes attended dinner parties with the man whose companion they were. Sources even suggest that a prized concubinus might pass from the father to son as an especially coveted inheritance. Moreover, a military officer on campaign might be accompanied by a concubinus, like the Catamite or Puer Delicatus. The role of the concubine was often compared to that of Ganymede, the Trojan prince abducted by Jove to serve as his cupbearer. Amazing. 
Still, during the early imperial era, male concubines or same-sex weddings were not technically recognized by Roman law, but were surprisingly common. Or how common? Even the emperors were doing it. And you know what? Peeking behind the curtains into the private lives of the Roman emperors offers an eye-opening experience into the customs, mores, and attitudes of the ancient world. Let's have a look. Starting with an imperial debauchee, Nero, who ruled from AD 54 to AD 68, full of remorse after kicking to death his pregnant wife, Poppea Sabina, sought out a surrogate who resembled her, and found Sporus, not a woman, but a young man. Nero's people castrated the ex-slave, and the couple married in a traditional ceremony, which included a bridal veil and even a dowry. Sporus joined Nero in bed with Pythagoras, another freedman Nero had married, who nightly played the role of a husband in their troilism. Sporus routinely accompanied Nero decked out as his empress. Moving ahead, Roman Emperor Hadrian also appeared to have preferred the company of men and homosexual relations. The great love of his life, Antinus, was a young man from Bithynia. Despite the problematic dynamics, the great inequality in age and status, their relationship remains perhaps the most well-known homosexual relationship from the ancient world. It became an iconic feature of the arts in painting, sculptures, and literature. The relationship between the two is a prominent theme of Marguerite Yourcenar's Memories of Hadrian, 1951. Antinus used to travel with the emperor and imperial court. That was until he died on Hadrian's tour through Egypt. As the imperial entourage traveled down the Nile, Antinous drowned. Now, whether this was murder, suicide, or even offered as a sacrifice as Cassius Dio ponders, remains a mystery. And Hadrian mourned the loss of his great love, founding the city of Antinopolis on the site where Antinous had died. The emperor's lover had become the subject of a cult, worshipped around the empire in at least 28 temples, and celebrated in games that were held in cities around the empire, including at Antinopolis. Then, in the 3rd century AD, Emperor Elagia Ballas also had a slew of male lovers, most notoriously Hyercules, a former slave and chariot driver, and Zoticus, a handsome young athlete whom he married in a public ceremony in Rome. In a nutshell, homosexuality and keeping male concubines for men in ancient Rome was no big deal if you were born a free male who liked taking the active role. However, the strictures of Roman law and tradition applied only to sexual relations among free men and women. Sexual relations between free men and female or male slaves were unlikely to incur much social stigma. Although there is evidence that some Romans did indeed exploit their slaves, fortunately, the great lacuna within the law and tradition, together with the emergence of more humane values regarding slavery and sexual relations, allowed genuine love relationships, both heterosexual and homosexual, to receive a large measure of social action as a form of concubinage. Roman culture, however, unlike classical Greek civilization, made little contribution to an informed acceptance of homosexual relations grounded in an understanding of human ethics and psychology. Well, there you have it. We hope you liked this video. <laughs> if you did, hit the like button and subscribe to this channel without any delay. Make sure you turn on the post notification and also let us know in the comments section about your views on these bizarre practices from the sex life of ancient Romans. Thanks for watching Unthinkable Past. Until the next time we meet, continue learning and stay healthy. Goodbye.